Okay, three, two, one. Okay, so I'm here with Erica Schickel, and Erica is a, a very established, uh, successful writer with, uh, I think, how many memoirs have you done now? Like oh, my second three? is about to be published. That's great, all. yeah. And she's also uh, been a, uh, a strong progressive voice on a couple of different uh, talk shows that we had on Radio Titans. One was uh, the uh, cause effect where I was trying, not necessarily succeeding, but the idea was to flip what Bill Maher does, where he has a lot of strong conservatives mixed in, but he's a uh, from a progressive point of view, and I'm a conservative, and I tried to have strong liberal points of view in. And then after that show ended with Trump's election, it switched to a full-on uh, progressive talk show that Dr. Dave hosts uh, called uh, Let's Be Treasonable. And Erica has been a much, you know, just as big or bigger part of that uh, over the last four, four or five years since that happened. So we're going to talk about that stuff. So Erica, um, how did you first get the invite? Because I don't think I knew you before, uh, b before we started doing the cause effect. Do you remember how we got in touch together? Or? Absolutely, I remember. It was through the good offices of our mutual friend, Sandra Singh Lowe, who is oh, wow. a local celebrity, author, science journalist, comedian, NPR, yeah. performance artist. And she was the one who referred you to me or me to you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So um, what did you think of, you know, because... One thing we're being warts and all in this thing because, um, you know, the only way to get away with being the interviewer in a movie about something that I ran is if we're all being honest about stuff. So I'm admitting throughout that I was a terrible promoter and businessman. I had great creatives. We, you know, we did a lot of good creative things, but we never were a big hit, um, you know, but yet I think that good things were done on these shows. So any thoughts about, uh, you know, first the cause effect, I guess, um, what I was attempting to do, like the flip side of Bill Maher. Uh, do you think we managed to have some good debates there? Uh, or do you think that, and you can say if you think something didn't work, it's totally fine. Well, I mean, I loved the idea initially, and um, but I sort of came in a little bit after, I mean, late in that game when yeah. you had built a platform that hosted conservative and liberal voices. So um, my recollection is that I didn't, I didn't experience a lot of friction or pushback on the panel. There were a couple of guys early on who sort of leaned conservative, but um, I think one of the problems with, with that platform that we encountered is that we were doing it in Los Angeles where, you know, conservative voices are hard to come by. Yeah. So, yeah. and then, and then, of course, with the rise of the Trump era, when things became sort of politics became less recreational and more sort of, you know, essential survival choices. Uh, I think that that we finally gave up on that sort of the conceit of right left and just swung left. Which is, I'm reflecting sort of the, the, the nature in the room and not the behind the scenes issues that you know. Uh, it's fine because um, I was the one who, uh, I, I, I kind of had a feeling because at the time, um, I don't want to, I'm not going to push my views and probably even edit this comment out of the movie. But as I wrote you uh, in asking you to do the interview, um, that I've come to realize how toxic the atmosphere that Trump caused, uh, like I snapped out of like, it was like a cult or something. And thank God I didn't drink the Kool-Aid on January 6th. It was like, um, my whole family was watching in horror going, whoa, this really did <laughs> didn't turn out so well. And so, um, so anyway, but I, I, I had a feeling, I wasn't a fan of his until the second State of the Union. I won't get into all the whys and whatevers, but, I, d I didn't know what to think of him early on. So I said, hey, why don't we just do a show? You guys really hate this guy. Um, I don't really know what to think of him yet. I voted uh, Ron Johnson Libertarian that year. Um, and I said, why don't we just go all out? Maybe if we have one point of view, this could be a better show. And we all had breakfast at Denny's, I think. And 
um, and, and Jim Coughlin came up with the great name, Let's Be Treasonable, and you guys have run with that ever since. I know you're not on every week, but I, uh, mm -hmm. I know you're fairly regular and you were on it for a long time. So um, any thoughts about how that has gone uh, over the last four years? Uh, what's it like having a platform, even if the audience isn't ginormous? Um, do you yeah, find value in it or uh, that kind of thing? I have no sense of what the audience is. Um, and I never really looked at the podcast as a way to like increase my audience. I just assumed there was no audience. Uh, <laughs> and I, I really used the, uh, I really just used it as an outlet for political frustration. You know, it was like I, there was a place to go where I could talk about what was happening in our country and sort of register my objections to it, you know, with with people who were on the same page as me, which is, I, I will grant you is sort of of limited uh, usefulness, um, you know, to be, you know, cosseted among the choir like that. But uh, it was, it was a good mental health exercise for me to be honest, perfectly honest. Yeah. So, um, well, that's good. So then, um, what do you feel? Okay. And you can talk about <laughs> the thing that drove you away from my apartment. Cause like I said, it's warts and all, and the Gaylord, is going to be joked about a lot because we, uh, you know, it, it was a weird hosting talk shows for three years out of my apartment, right. and then also uh, a lot of weird things happened. Like the cast of Three's Company, the surviving cast, all showed up one day for another show. Uh, actually, you, were you there that day? That yeah, the Three's Company. Was, okay, I so I want to tell that time. story, and and so I would love to get your reaction. And if you were pissed, the, all the better. Uh, not that I wanted you pissed at the time, but I mean. Basically, okay, so the story is, uh, we're going to ho hopefully get this more, like I'm trying to get Priscilla Barnes, who caused this to happen, uh, as on in the movie, I'm just waiting to hear from her. But anyway, so Priscilla Barnes, sitcom actress from Three's Company, she had a talk show called Barnstorming, where she would get her character actor friends to be guests and tell their old stories. And one week she said, hey, I'm going to bring whoever's alive from Three's Company over. And so it was this amazing thing happened. I heard about it from the doorman and everybody in the lobby later that they all showed up one by one. Like they, everybody thought it was like some elaborate prank because people still recognize Joyce DeWitt or the guy who played Larry, the sleazy friend of Jack Tripper. And so all these people started assembling, hey, I'm looking for Carl Kozlowski. And, and people were wondering what the hell's going on? Like they sort of had an idea that I had a podcast out of my apartment, but everybody thinks podcasting from home is just this tiny enterprise that you know people just screw around in their kitchen with friends. And I, and you know, and so this was like a mind blower to them that these famous faces from their childhood were showing up one at a time. And meanwhile, on the inside, was you guys were scheduled to do Let's Be Treasonable, and the, all these all these sitcom stars showed up an hour early. I don't even know what happened, but Priscilla had no sense of time and she would either show up an hour early or an hour late, depending on the day. And she shows up an hour early with all of them. And you guys had just sat down and uh, you're my friends and, you know, and I, and I wanted to respect you guys, but they made it impossible. They were like, well, we're here. We can't wait all day. And it was like the chance of a lifetime to have that situation. So it became like a real life threes company where I was ducking in and out of the door and on the one side, I'm whispering, pleading with all of you guys, please don't get pissed, please, but can you please go? And, and you guys are rightfully annoyed. And then, then I'm running out to the outside and I'm begging them, I'm doing what I can, but they're my friends, they're on every week. And you know, you showed up early and I was back and forth, just like Jack Tripper in the show. Yeah. And finally, you guys agreed to pack up and leave. And I had them uh, come in. But uh, any memories of that, you can say whatever, as negative as you want or positive or whatever. Well, I, you've asked me a few questions. So let's just yeah, begin, sure. let's begin with the Gaylord, um, sure. which I have to say, I absolutely loved going to the Gaylord once a week. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's set up at all in this documentary, but I mean, it is a really beautiful, old, historic Los Angeles building in a fantastic 
old neighborhood in the mid Wilshire or Wilshire district uh, close to Koreatown. So, I mean, stepping into that building was like stepping into history and then they acknowledge it. And there was the excellent bar, remind me of the name of the bar, the Bound Bounty, Bounty. Yeah. Bounty, which is a, one of the great dive bars of Los Angeles. So, and you know, uh, you had Ernie Powell there, you had people, you know, sort of really interesting people in the building. So I really enjoyed that aspect of going to the Gaylord. Um, less enjoyable was visiting your apartment, Carl, <laughs> which was a one bedroom. No, studio. Uh, a studio, it was a yeah. studio. And so, and here I am taking pride that I was somebody who never sexually harassed anyone. But the funny thing is, so many women came in there the first time and were like, yeah. whoa, why is your bed like yeah. 10 feet from the, the yeah. table? We're, 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 we're working next to your bed. Uh, <laughs> my issue was that there was never any toilet paper in the bathroom oh and the bathroom was filthy and disgusting. And there was just an enormous roach problem that got progressively worse while we were <laughs> working together. And I think the tipping point for me was when the roaches were running up the table legs and right at me as I was trying to podcast. And I finally was like, you know what? I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not having any fun here. I'm grossed out. I moved to Los Angeles from New York to get away from cockroaches, most yeah. 80% ex-boyfriends and cockroaches. So I finally was just like, you know, fuck it. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but, you know, and then I think that sort of helped prompt like a reimagining and, 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 you know, David Robinson took over the show and, you know, the complaint was lodged, whatever. Um, as to the Three's Company uh, incident, you know, I mean, my memories of that are pretty vague. I remember seeing some very heavily reconstructed sort of late middle-aged people showing up claiming to be <laughs> on a sitcom that I stopped watching when I was like nine. So <laughs> there was a lot of sort of celebrity frisson in the room. And, you know, and of course these people always have expectations of, you know, red carpet and preferential treatment which was sort of hard to roll out at the Gaylord, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, it's all like stand in the hallway and then come back later. So I don't really remember that, but I do remember her being around and you sort of juggling the two things. And I, I don't know, I didn't really think much of it. I, I mean, I probably was put out at the time because I was like, look, I'm driving over here for free every week to do this and battle the cockroaches. And now I've got, fucking washed up celebrity sitcom celebrities, you know, walking all over it. But that's just me being a prickly old bitch, you know. Um, I, I, otherwise, you know. The thing is, again, you know, the answer to many of these questions is like, well, you you were doing it in Hollywood, you know. So, you know, so old celebrities showing up on the radar is not that unusual in this town. It's sort of, you know, we got them. They're around and they're looking to stay current and be on shows and that's what happened. Okay, so um, I guess two final questions I have. Um, I'll try to be calmer and, and separate them. Um, okay, so one, uh, I'm not looking for this to be a self-aggrandizing uh, project by any means. Mm -hmm. But um, just it's something that a lot of people have brought up. And so I thought I'd ask you, um, what are your thoughts on the fact that did it surprise you that a guy who um, is obnoxiously conservative on Facebook and, you know, is a, uh, you know, white male uh, who is conservative and, and Catholic and all this, you know, that's like very diametrically opposed to a lot of your worldview that I would uh, be open and eager to have people of another other points of view uh you know on my uh, network was that something unusual to you or was that just like oh okay whatever um again los angeles it's unusual in the sense that there aren't a lot of you you guys are sort of unicorns in the in this in the local environment um but you know bill maher has set 
that sort of precedent. Um, and, you know, the television box is full of oppositional talking heads. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked by it and really, um, and I appreciated it. You know, I, I, I like argument and I like diverging viewpoints. Um, I, you know, I think I, I struggled with your narcolepsy more than <laughs> I struggled with your political standpoints because you tended to nod off in the middle of recording the episodes. <laughs> and then couldn't cue things up and so forth. So, I mean, I remember at the time feeling like, God, I wish our producer could just stay awake through the whole pod. So, you know, we could run it. But, um, but yeah, you know, right wing viewpoints, while I, I object to them on moral grounds, you know, uh, they don't freak me out per se. You know, okay. I'm happy. Uh -oh. Yeah, so uh, then the other, okay, so I guess the also, last thing- let me thing just say, Carl, that you were not an, a, a particularly offensive right winger, you know, all that said. I mean, you kept yourself fairly on the sidelines and sort of handed it over. And again, I was sort of late to the cause effect where you probably had a larger role. And I, you know, I came in in that transitional time and also Trump time. So, you know, I didn't really experience you primarily as like some kind of a right wing antagonist, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, then I guess the last thing I want to ask about is uh, one thing that I do take pride in uh, pretty highly was that within a couple of weeks of Harvey Weinstein's uh, scandal being blown open, um, but right as people were starting to call it Me Too and all that, uh, I, I really think it was within two weeks I had you and two other women, um, Christina Myers Hepburn and uh, Leah Knauer, over, and you guys did an episode of my podcast, which was called Oh Man, That's Awful. And usually that show was designed to get people to talk about their worst life moments in a funny way, but um, I knew this was really serious and I wanted to have. Uh, you know, this kind of stuff address and say, yeah, this isn't just, you know, what happens to um, around uh, some giant honcho. Um, this is something that probably is happening to all of our uh, friends that are women on a regular basis. And so any, any memories of, of that experience talking about that stuff? Did that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I really appreciated those two women who I thought were very lively, engaged, interesting people. And it was nice to be among women on, on your podcast, you know, because I am often the only woman in the room on this podcast, or at least at that point I was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my Me Too story, first of all, every woman pretty much has a Me Too story. I mean, there's, you it, it, it is a conceit that we are our own distinct population from the female population. I mean, to grow up female in this country, to live as a woman in this country is to experience sexual harassment and misogyny on a near daily basement basis, especially if you're a young woman. Um, my Me Too story, uh, which uh, is uh, the subject of my forthcoming memoir, The Big Hurt, Hachette, August 2021, hmm. um, is about having been predated upon at, as a teenager in an East Coast prep school by a married teacher. Um, I was engaged in a sexual affair by this teacher. And when the school found out, they expelled me. I mean, effectively expelled me. So the book sort of looks at that event and the events and how, how that echoed through my adult life and echoes still, you know, in my life. So, um, so I had a very specific story to tell about that. Um, but the conversation was wide ranging and so super smoking white hot at that time, Me Too. Um, I think we've entered the backlash years, alas. Um, Harvey Weinstein 
was sort of the great bete noir of that moment. Um, and parenthetically, hilariously, when he was taken to his arraignment, he was photographed holding a copy of my father's D.W. Griffith book, which oh is God. sort of, which is funny because it sort of loops back into my story of what happened to me and my own father who loved me dearly and yet aided and abetted um, this sort of form of misogyny throughout my whole life. So it was a thing that I was struggling with at the time. So I really appreciated the outlet. I appreciated the intention of that, of that, of that show. Um, I don't know what audience reaction to it was like or any of that, but I, you know, it was, it was a worthwhile experience for me. Okay, cool. Um, anything else that you'd like to bring up? Otherwise, I think I'm set with what I need to ask. Um, no, I, I mean, I think okay. a, a, a fun experiment and, you know, fun endeavor and, uh, yeah, it's been great. Okay, hang on one second. I'm stopping. I want to ask you something still. Uh...